If we can get quiet, I've got the talking stick. Get ready to get us. I got the talking stick. Everybody keep quiet. Here you go. Official one. Official talking stick. Okay, we're going to. Ed, sit down. You have to hit him on the head with us. Don't open that. That's too long to make that. That's a buffalo draw. Anyhow, if y'all can hear me above Ed. We want to we want to rush this up because we got a real great speaker. We may have to have him back three or four times to get all the information out of it that he has. Anyhow, there's some things coming up. I talked to uh, Sandra, and Sandra lives at Gilmer. I don't know if you know her or not. I can't remember her last name. Anyhow, she was hoping to come tonight. She used, used to come all the time. Anyhow, she told me that there is going to be a powwow at Broken Bow, April the 5th at the high school. And also there is a stickball game at Mewonka, and that's 10 miles west of Idabel. So if anybody wants to go to those, I don't know for sure what day the stickball game is. If you've never seen a stickball game, it is the little brother to war. <laughs> so, has anybody got anything else? Gee. Yes. Yes, I got an invitation to the Cherokee Nation to the community meeting and folks join the event in Fort Worth at the Botanical Gardens the 29th of this month. And it's from 9 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. He'll be speaking to the chief at 1130. This is a Cherokee. Uh, and you can get your Cherokee Nation photo and ID at the top. And uh, let's see. Culture activities will be conducted and award-winning Cherokee Buddhist and National Treasure Tommy Wildcat will be there. <laughs> and, uh, Has anybody got anything else? Because I know we want to get into our program real quick. Anything coming up anybody knows of? Bill, have you got the program next month? Since you've done it this month. I, yeah, I, I know you bumped, you bumped it off. <laughs> so you got it next month. <laughs> okay. Be sure to remind him. I'll have to. Three times. <laughs> I'm going to get Bill to introduce Otter. It's the only thing that I know. And he can tell us. I met uh, Otter recently at a ceremony uh, where grave markers were being placed and you know I just looked at him, he impressed me so much and I, I thought we should get to know this guy better than, and uh, we have gotten to know him and uh, he has a love for his for Indian culture, uh, that of, especially that of the Cherokees. And, you know, he, he's, uh, he's from Gilmer, and uh, it's just an honor to have him tonight. And like uh, Ronnie said, uh, I don't think he, he can uh, cover everything he'd like to cover tonight, so he's welcome to come back next month. <laughs> you don't even know what I'm watching. <laughs> ah. Wow. This man is called Smiling Otter who tames the wind by the elders that know him. And 30 years ago, a minister, a visiting evangelist made a statement during his sermon one Sunday morning that the man that doesn't know who he is will never know what he is. And I sat there, I didn't hear another word the man said all day long because his statement impacted me to the degree I was sitting there focusing, I know nothing about my family. When I was a child, most of my family was very dark complected, black haired, black eyed. They had very shalagi features. They all looked like him. <laughs> and I'd ask my grandmother, who are we? She said, we're black Dutch. Yeah. 
Well, I can read. I'd go to the libraries and I'd dig and I'd dig and I'd dig and I couldn't find any black Dutch anywhere on this planet. Well, the day that minister made that statement, I told my wife, I said, I'm taking the weekend off. We're driving up to get, uh, Dangerfield and we're going to talk to the surviving members of the family. And that weekend, I found an old family Bible that I had a bunch of hand-penciled records in it that led me back to the 1835 census of Cherokee east of the Mississippi where I found two family names. Reverend John Hass, the Shalagi calling Bushy Head, and uh, a guy named Arch Campbell. And I was shocked because here is a legal document that you have to handle like an archaeological artifact, this old Bible would fall apart in your hands, that ties us in to the Black Dutch. Now then, a little bit of fun. How many of you have ever, if you've heard Black Dutch? How many here is Black Dutch? Yeah, okay. That means Cherokee. <laughs> How many heard of the urban legend of a feral child raised by wolves in northeast Texas? No? Good, it's starting to die out. When I was a kid, I got adopted by a pack of red wolves in Cypress Creek. And uh, I hunted for them, ran with them. When I'd get off down there in the bottom and my family would come try to find me, they couldn't because the wolves had let me know they were coming, and it was kind of neat. So mine has always been of the Indian mind, even though I didn't know I was one. And uh, so I started following the Red Road. I wanted to learn about the traditions and the beliefs of my people. Started finding out some interesting things. The Lakota, Lakota name for the creator, Tonkashilawakantanka, translates in English, Tonka, creator. Shila, the son of, Wakantanka, the great spirit or the great mystery. Depends on what Shalagi dialect you speak of the old tongues, not what we talk today. In one dialect, the name for our creator was Yoa. In the other one, it was Yahweh. We referred to the Creator as Edoda. It literally translates Father, but in that context it means the three elder fires above. I never knew this. I thought these were primitive people. Then we come to Texas, and one day this Carissa Comacruro brother of mine, full blood, <coughs> Raven Clan, Cacalote, he walks up with this old book. He still got it. I wish I had it. And he opens it to a map and he says, Hey, Ah, look at this. Does that look familiar? And I get to looking at it. Yeah. So we made a copy of the page and made a transparency where we could overlay it on present day Texas maps. This map came from the early 1600s when the French explorers came through here looking for gold. Do you know how much gold is in the iron ore around here? The problem is it will kill you to get it out of it. All the mercury fumes. Well, they found a Cherokee village on Big Cypress Creek up there where Boggy Creek comes from the north and joins it. I own 90 acres of land where that village was located that I inherited through my family. Because when the Texans started moving in here, they realized it wasn't a good idea to be an Indian, so they started calling themselves Black Dutch. And folks, we're still here. So I guess you could call me a sixth generation Texas Cherokee. Well, that got me interested in the history of this land. And now we come to Dragging Canoe. How many are familiar with the name? <laughs> Principal chief in Tennessee. When he passed away, he had a war chief. Oh wait, I digress. Let me back up. This is funny. Texas, uh, Cherokee settled in Texas near the Red River, pressed further south by American settlement 
1820, about 60 families under Chief Bowl, Diwali, settled in Rust County near the Cados. As Americans settled that area, distrust grew between them and the Cherokee, hoping to gain a legal title to their land. The Cherokee invested a great deal of energy in cultivating a relationship with Mexico, hoping to protect this relationship. They remained neutral between Texas and Mexico during the Texas Revolution. Now, we're going to go back and correct some Xalagihiyele de Tejas history. Dragon Canoe passed away and there was a man named Dewa, uh, Spring Frog, Tuanta. He was Diwali's, I mean, uh, Dragon Canoe's war chief. This is him. I'm going to pass this around. He gathered up about 200 families and came to the ancestral lands here. 1782. God, he looks like my Uncle Donald. <clears throat> In 1789, the Alcalde of the Spanish lands there took Spring Frog to Mexico City and through whatever machinations they had to go through, he got a land grant to lands in what is now East Texas. And that land grant was fined by the King of Spain. It took me 28 years to find it but I found it. This was 1789. When Diwali, the bowl, came to Texas, he was following Spring Frog. How many know that Diwali was the peace chief under Dragging Canoe? You ever heard this in a history book? No. History is his story. The winners write it, folks, and it ain't always the truth. I mean, my wife got tickled at me today. I was watching a documentary on Abraham Lincoln. And they're still trying to whitewash the Civil War. <clears throat> I'm curious, how can an avowed atheist become a Christian after he dies? You know? Anyway. Well... In 1863, <laughs> during the Texas Revolution, Spring Frog's land grant was recognized as Phyllis Ola's Cherokee grant. And here it is. I have some maps that cover it, and here's a present day map that covers it. Ancestral Cherokee land. The Cherokee Trace came down across the Red River out of southwestern Arkansas and southeastern Oklahoma. The old settlers moved there long before the Trail of Tears. Went right straight through here, all the way to the Gulf Coast and down into Old Mexico, and there's a bunch of Cherokee in Old Mexico right now that are recognized by the Mexican government. And Sequoia is buried there with them. A child has found his grave. And it was just like Sequoia's prophecy. It was in a cave. And Sequoia said that when his grave was found, there would be a coming together of the people. And you're evidence of you're the evidence of that right now. People pursuing their history, their heritage, and their knowledge. And I'm shooting from the hip. I didn't have anything prepared. I didn't know what kind of people y'all are. <laughs> Here's Ta Chi. This is interesting. He was a Western Cherokee chief. His portrait got burned up in a museum. And I got a kind of a kick out of this. He refused to go into Oklahoma. Oh, he came down into Texas, right? Now I want y'all to pass this around. And look at the knife he's wearing in his satch. <laughs> Gosh, this is fun. 
<laughs> I found one. <laughs> it is known as the Cherokee buoy. I had to make my own sheath, however. But I get to represent my people. Now I'm going to talk about a little bit more about the history of Northeast Texas. Uh, June the 14th, there's going to be a to-do over in Morris County, Texas. At the, and this gets into the Confederate history too, unfortunately. I have a great-great-grandpa that's buried there that does not have a Confederate service marker on his grave, so we're going to put one there. And the, by the way, Bill, it's the Lone Star Color Guard, not Native American Color Guard. <laughs> I'm glad Sarge didn't shoot me. Uh, we're going to be putting a marker on his grave, and the sons of the Confederate veterans are going to be there. And I'll be doing my thing. But the funny part of it is, his daddy was a man named John Wingate Truett. He came here in 1839 from Alabama, left his family in Alabama because he wouldn't have gotten nothing in 1839 if he'd have brought, well, wait a minute. Yeah, that's when they certified it. He built a cabin in Morris County. And the Troy Cousins have just, we're about 75% done with restoring the cabin. It's the oldest cabin of its kind on the original site in Texas and we're kind of proud of it because 75% of the original structure was there and we're going to have this graveside honoring ceremony like Bill saw over there at the Snodgrass Cemetery and then they're going to march me and my son across the field to Mr. Wingate's cabin and they're going to swear us in on the front porch where Edward Robinson Truett grew up but he only got 320 acres because he had to leave his family in Alabama. If he'd have brought them with him, they'd have known he was an Indian and he wouldn't have got nothing. <laughs> this is a kick in the head here. I just found this. Truett family didn't even know about this. Republic of Texas County of Red River. Second class, number 112, 320 acres. This is to certify that Wingate Truett, spelled T-R-E-W-I-T, we spell it T-R-U-I-T-T. -T. You ever notice most people were just barely literate? Wingate Truett is entitled to a conditional head right of 320 acres of land agreeably to the provisions of the act passed January the 4th, 1839, extending donations of land to late immigrants. That I get a kick out of because we were already here. <laughs> Given under our hands this 13th day of November, 1839, attested I.G. Wright at Red River County, Red River County, I think it's, it says Extension Office. I don't know why they had to do all this. <laughs> Boy, they got with the program with those old quill pens. But the funny thing is, it's also signed by a guy named A.J. Fowler, Chief something or other, Red River County. My mother's maiden name is Fowler. And just recently I found out her daddy was Choctaw. <laughs> so you never know what you're going to find, folks. And we're having a ball. I'm having the time of my life, even though I'm going to quit having birthdays. Every time I have one, I'm a year older. <laughs> and, uh, but the history is so incredible. If you walk into the museum in Gilmer, anybody ever been in there? What, Gilmer? Have you, yeah, have you looked at the Cato exhibit? You remember those top two pots? That's Cherokee symbology on those pots. I took Bear, big old Blackfoot Indian in there one day. I said, come on, I'll show you So Bear, and he walks in there and he looks at it and starts laughing. <laughs> he said, who's the expert that identified these? <laughs> so yeah, I'm having a blast with it. And, and, and 
the most fun I have with these guys when I go to the powwows and I saw, see some Cherokee wearing a Lakota war bonnet or a Blackfoot with the feathers standing straight up. We Cherokee didn't wear those. We wore turbans. Like this. We were a little more civilated <laughs> than the rest of them. <laughs> and a friend of mine gave me this otter skin and this trade wool that's in it, which is about 200 years old. And the next time he saw the otter skin and the trade wool, I'd made this traditional Cherokee headdress. He immediately grabbed it and started trying to take it apart to see if I did it in a traditional manner. I did. And, uh, but yeah, I'm having the time of my life, and it's funny. I make flutes, I make the rattles, I make drums, I do beadwork, and I've never had anybody to teach me how. I'm convinced that within every one of us there is a genetic hereditary memory that we can tap into if we'll just listen to it. And I've had people pick up some of my crafting. Where'd you learn to do that? I just did it. Cheyenne. <laughs> like I said, I'm an orphan to the Cherokee. There are 13 different groups of Cherokee in the state of Texas that refuse to recognize one another. Major or er, Mr. Ridge, who's a descendant of Major Ridge has asked me to join the Southern Cherokee Nation, and I have yet to tell him that it was one of my great-great-great-grandpas that killed his great-great-great-grandpa <laughs> after they sold lands in the East for lands in Oklahoma. I don't know how he's going to take that. You know, but to see something like this blesses me no end because we're still here. And under old Southern law, now here's another kick I found out when I started digging through the family tree, folks. Genetically, I'm more red than black and I'm more black than white. I inherited this from two fourth great grandfathers and one great grandfather that snuck in kind of late, but he did marry a full blood Cherokee woman. Sarah Ann Thompson out of Tallapoosa County, Alabama. But then I found two of my ancestors on the slave register in Alabama in 1850. Well, I didn't find it. My wife found it. I thought, cool. I'm exactly what this country is supposed to be all about. <laughs> and uh, I don't know. I'm having the time of my life. What Bill saw me do at the graveside, when the elders gave me the name Smiling Otter Who Tames the Wind, I thought, what are they talking about? Well, about a year and a half later, I discovered the Siatanka, the courting flute. It was part of our courtship ritual. When a young man became enamored with a young woman, he'd make a flute, compose a song for her, go sit outside her father's lodge, play the song. She peeks out the lodge skin door, you know, and says, ooh, I like what I see. So she'd grab a robe, go out there, sit down next to him, wrap a robe around her shoulders. That told everybody, stay away, private conversation. If she didn't like what she saw, she dumped cold water on him and he had to leave. So this business about to go, go take a cold shower, uh-uh. <laughs> Below the white man, we've been doing this for 4,000 years. But when I discovered the Siatanka, and I can't explain this, it was like I'd been playing them all my life. All right. Play a Cherokee melody, we'll see how many of you recognize it, all right?
you will never be in a large Cherokee gathering that you will not hear that. It's fascinating history. I knew what you were going to play before you played it. <laughs> It blew me away. <laughs> you started playing and then when I was a child. I thought when I first started playing them, I just played whatever came to mind. And I at this melody. Chanupa, this sacred pipe, I rescued it out of a, a trading post. We prayed with the pipe. The bowl represents Mother Earth. The stem represents our Creator. Now right now it's just an artifact, but when you join the stem and the bowl, that becomes the chinupa. At that time, you need to load it, and folks, we don't put nothing funny in the pipe. The kinnikinnik is all natural, and it will not alter your perception of reality. Reality is strange enough as it is. And when you like And uh, when I found it in the trading post, I asked the guy that had the place, I said, Charlie, what's that doing in there? Case, he says, I found it out in Arizona. And he said, and I thought I was on a buying trip and I thought it was going to be great. Got back, haven't sold a thing in six months. I said, that pipe needs to come out of that tray case. You don't sell the pipe. And he says, I, yeah. He says, I've been kind of thinking that. He said, I was fooling around in here one day and I joined the, I plugged that stem into that bowl. The temperature dropped about 10 degrees in here and the hair stood out on the back of my neck. I said, Charlie, you should have loaded the pipe and prayed with it. He said, I don't know nothing about that. I said, well, it needs to come out of here. He says, yeah. Spent $450 on that. I said, I ain't buying a pipe from you, Charlie. You know, I ain't stupid. I ain't gonna play Russian roulette with no single shot pistol. He said, well, get it out of here. So that's how the pipe came into my Care. And I don't know that it's going to stay with me because I honor another pipe that's 500 years old from the Smoky Mountains. And uh, a younger Chinupa that the Carissa Comacruto people here in Texas presented me because I got them some measure of 
recognition. And uh, it's funny, they're right down there close to George Bush's ranch, too. When he was governor, he said there ain't no Indians in Texas. Folks, I'm here to tell you something. The Cato, the Kashai, the Tonkawa, the Karankawa, Koaltekans, uh, Yaqui, Tarahamara, the Cacalote, the Carissa Comacroto, allegedly extinct. If they're extinct, I know a bunch of lively ghosts. <laughs> Because I meet them every day. And they've been generous enough to take this old orphan that didn't know anything about his heritage in and share their life with me. So, like I said, I'm having the time of my life. Anybody want to ask me something? Because I can stand up here and blow smoke all day long. So. <laughs> yeah, um, you know about that Kula Kula? No, sir, I don't. We're supposed to be dragging your new father. A little carpenter. Yeah. Went back to uh, say, uh, King Henry II. And then we returned back. And then the reason why we got to know about that is because uh, the letter that was wrote by Captain John Stewart. Uh, you, you realize that we're hereditary enemies here. I'm a captain. <laughs> At any rate, you know, history is history. Yeah. And uh, what the deal was, how all this came about, was uh, Linda paint portraits. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah. And uh, she was asked by the setting chief at the time of the Chickamauga to paint the first chief, which was dragging to do. Yeah. Well, there was a deal that happened. Uh, she said, well, I can paint anything, but what did he look like? Because there's never been a picture of him. Yeah. So the tribal shaman, Richard Craker, said, hey, we have a letter in our archives wrote by Captain John Stewart. And he was a Scotsman. And he said he described it in his letter. And he describes the women. He describes the town, all this kind of thing, from Choda to New Choda and all this. Mm -hmm. You know, stuff that I'm not really living with on it. But uh, at any rate, at Kula Kula was supposedly dragging to his father a peace chief that went to, to the five friendly tribes yeah. to see King Henry. And in, in, in that time, I delved into a little bit more. And uh, they discovered this, this campaign of Indians, discovered what the English or Henry was about up to, and they were going to kill him. But they didn't. They got transferred back to this continent. And uh, what it all started off with was uh, John Stewart had a, uh, he was a captain, and uh, they went to Fort Lawton. And there was a <coughs> commander there by the name of DeMeyer. <coughs> and he had put 21 Indians, killed 21 Indians. So the Indians came in and took over Fort Lawton, and, and Stewart was there. And it, it's quite a, it's quite a deal. Anyhow, he was writing this story back to his sister Patty in Edinburgh, Scotland, and telling him of his adventures in the into of America. And it's kind of interesting, but that's where at Kula Kula again. I'd love to see that portrait. Yeah. You just brought some five civilized tribes. I got the biggest kick out of this, folks. That's what they call them. Uh, we got drafted into the Lone Star Color Guard the sons of the Confederate veterans, representing the Cherokee Mounted Rifles. From Stan Waddy's crew, of course, there was both sides. They were on both sides of the fence. But they ended up, the Cherokee Mounted Rifles had their own flag. There's an example of it here. Well, I just found a, a symbol. The field of the white stars representing the, the states that seceded from the Union, and in the center, there's four red stars. I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. There were five red stars. That represents the five civilized tribes. And then one day, one of my Blackfoot brothers walked up and handed me this. Now, I'm going to pass it around because it's kind of, I thought the Civil War was over. This is a seal 
of the southern Cherokee Nation. And it was established November the 27th of 1834, which kind of predates the Civil War. <laughs> and it's still the seal. The Civil War is not over. <laughs> and uh, like I said, I have a ball. How many gun nuts do we have in here? Oh, good. I have an 1860 model army that my father owned. Let's see. Are you in here? Of course you are. Somewhere. Or my son took it out. Nope, there you are. It's a replica. But it does have collector value. And it was made for my father. So anyway, I've got this little cap and ball pistol. I'm going to start wearing it. Sounds like it's better, better. And a historian says, that's not authentic. Well, what are you talking about? He said, the only way one of them Southern Cherokee would have been carrying an 1860 model army is if he took it away from a Yankee. I said, that was known to have happened. <laughs> he said, well, yeah. He said, what you need to be authentic is a Griswold and Gunnison. I said, what's a Griswold and Gunnison? Well, it was a copy of the Navy Colt, 1851, and they made 3,000 of them in the South, and then Sherman come along and burnt the factory down. You talk about a terrorist. I mean, that cat done a number. And if I could find a real 1851, or a Gris, Griswold and Gunnison, you're looking at what, a million dollars? <laughs> He says, I've got a replica of one. I said, how much you want for it? He says, I want a shotgun like yours to kill snakes with. So I went and bought him a new little 410 shotgun, and he traded me a Griswold and Gunnison. And I think they're prettier than the Colts. And seeing as how I'm representing the Cherokee Mounted Rifles, I hand carved me some prayer feathers and then laid them in the gun grips. Now all the guys are wanting me to inlay their weapons in the sons of the Confederate veterans. I told them I'll do it as long as it stays fun. If it gets to be like work, I quit. Because I'm, I'm enjoying life now. And uh, my dream eventually is for sovereignty rights and recognition within the Republic of Texas for the Shalagiyeli our people, and to see a coming together of the Cherokee that are in Texas because, like I said, they're the most factionistic, divided people on the planet. As far as I'm concerned, the word politic, poly, Greek word meaning many, tick, blood-sucking parasite. <laughs> Amen. And I'm tired of it. So I apologize for being politically incorrect if it involves a lie. And I apologize in advance because I've drawn a line in the sand and I'm raising enough stink that I've already got the state of Texas mad at me, which is all right. <laughs> I could care less. And uh, because I love my country and I love my people. And the Bible that I read, that's funny, we're in a Methodist church because my uncle was a Methodist and my grandpa was a Baptist. They'd get out on the porch swing with their Bibles and start debating and we'd have to go out there and break it up. <laughs> but it reads that our Creator will make of all men one nation. And I long to see that. Are you... Are you uh... Cherokee? Yes, sir. Well, Cherokee, Catawba, and Choctaw. The Catawba are extinct, except I haven't quit breathing. That's about all I got for me. My mother was born in Cherokee County, close to that coast. Yes, sir. That's down there in 1898. You betcha. Well, it's funny. Because I wish I'd have brought pictures of my grandparents and, and my daddy and his two brothers. My Lord, they look like a war party. They could 
could be a war party, come to think of it. And, uh, but it wasn't a good idea to be an Indian in Texas in the 40s and 50s. As late as 1962, they were still taking Indian children from their families and adopting them out and closing the records in the United States of America. One of my Navajo sisters, I'm adopted Tyron House Clan Diné. Uh, <laughs> I have ties to many nations. I, I don't know what's going on. She told me that she had an aunt who went to a hospital to have a baby. They knocked this woman out, took the child's cesarean, and they removed her ovaries so she could have no more children. And this was in 1954. I don't know what's going on. So you understand why I don't like government, I don't like politics. I like the community that's described in 1 Corinthians. I submit to you, they say that Greece is the birthplace of democracy, horse feathers, and buffalo burgers. <laughs> in this country, if a decision needed to be made within the village, the whole village gathered around and everybody in the village had a voice. As long as they held the talking stick. I love that. I've got the talking stick, he said. From age 5 to 95 or 105 or 145, they had a voice. And then the council made a decision based on the input of everyone in the tribe. Then they had to take it to the clan mothers and say, this is the decision we made. What do you think? And if the women said, eh, it didn't happen. <laughs> but the point of the being, it was a real democracy. It was not a representative democracy. And they came here and messed it up. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Here, Corey, we were taught in school that... <clears throat> Both the men, the women, and the children cast their vote for the chiefs. Whoever the, the two chiefs were, they would stand in front of the there, and the, and they would come in and they would put the stone in front of what chief they were voting for, and at the end they would count the uh, ballots. But senator is from the uh, you know the Iroquois. Yeah. Well. And uh, and, yeah. a, and a lot of what what is in the uh, our constitution. Uh, did come from the uh, Iroquois, which uh, the state of Connecticut, which is known as the Constitution State, took a lot of that out of the Iroquois. That's where and Jefferson and 16. Franklin and company got the, the uh, ideas for the United States Constitution. Mm -hmm. At one time, the laws of the Iroquois and Confederacy yep. were written on the walls of the capital of the United States of America, but they covered it up and wiped it out. And now look what they're doing to our Constitution. It makes me cry. <laughs> but uh, I could be an angry Indian. But if you're angry, you will accomplish nothing. So I try to find the humor in it. I got a young, my younger son. I wish he could have come tonight. <laughs> This kid could have fun in the middle of a tornado. And he is an absolute hoot. He's a, gosh, he would be a seventh generation Texas Cherokee. And if he hadn't been so worn out when he got home, he would showed up wearing a deer skin scalp shirt. A real one. <laughs> We, we're having a blast. We're having a blast. And I, I didn't know there was something like this over here. The other time I came to Winsboro, they were having those Winsboro Wild West days. I almost didn't get out of there with these two things. Those cowboys wanted them. They was going to hold a raffle and hang an Indian. But uh, <laughs> had a lot of fun. But then meeting Mr. Bill, and, and Bill, I, I'm not 
kidding. I am having the time of my life. Next, no, it's coming weekend, Saturday. Everybody know where Camp Ford is in Tyler? The, the Confederate prisoner war camp? There's going to be a whole bunch of rebels down there, and they're probably be running around shooting <clears throat> cannons and, and running back and forth. And myself and Bear, we're hoping to put up a booth down there. We're going to be selling a lot of Indian jewelry and craft work down there. We were invited to do this. And so far, I guess we're the only ones that have been invited to do it. But I recommend you go to watch it. Just watch the horses when they're doing the reenactment. Because those horses get into it, man. One Yankee threw down his gun, stood up, said, I surrender. And the horse like run out of hunter. He said, there's another one over there in the draw. Let's go get him. <laughs> it's, a, it's a hoot. But. Where is that camp? It's, as you're going down, uh, what is it, 155, just before you get to Tyler? It's on the left down there, Camp Ford. And it'll be all day Saturday. 155. Or is it 155 or 151? It's either two spots. Yeah. Going out toward Palestine? 155. Yeah. yeah comes in 155. Church. I can drive it. I just can't tell you how to get there. But uh, anybody want to ask me anything? I may have an answer. I may not. Yes, ma'am. You touched on it just a little bit while ago. What connection are you to Bushy? Not what she had, but yeah. Reverend John Hess? Yeah. He's my great 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 grandfather. Are you also related to the Sizemores? The Sizemores? I'm not sure. Because I'm related to the Bushy Heads and the Sizemores. Okay. Well, they called him Bushy Head. I think his wife was a Bushy Head. Well. And you know how you took on your wife's claim? <laughs> Yeah. Well, how how I became a, a bushy head is through this same thing Gary was talking to you about. When his when Captain Stewart. John Stewart married into the tribe, and then his son married, was you know started no becoming dude. prominent. No they dude called dude. him in my lineage. They called him no due to uh, bushy head. The son. Mm -hmm. That was the name they give him. And then um, the son after that was called Bushyhead as well. But the reason where the name Bushyhead came from, because the Scottish had bushy hair. I know. And that's where Bushyhead came from. That's, that's something I've got. I've got that that, oh, that yeah. straight puppy fur of the Native American people. But it, it shows John Stewart, yeah. and then, it's, then it shows uh, his son is no due to Stewart, and then it says no due to Stewart Bushyhead. And then wow. from there on, it's Bushyhead. I think Reverend John's wife was one of the Bushyheads. I do know they took his chapel apart and carried it on the Trail of Tears to Oklahoma and put it back up there at where the Trail of Tears ended. I've never been there. I just recently found out about this. He somehow, when the Dawes started coming into being because it, you know, it predated the final Dawes roll by many years, he said to heck with you, and he was a reservee for having fought in the War of 1812. He went back to Alabama, and I recently found a deed yeah. that he purchased some land, and it was registered in Lebanon. It wasn't in Lebanon. It was somewhere in Wells Valley up there, close to Pisgah. And the deed, he purchased 40 acres of land, paid for it, and the deed was signed by President Polk. I have a copy of that. But then he and his son Peter are buried there in Wells Valley. But Peter's son, James Marshall Hass, came to Texas. And his wife was this Sarah Elnora Truitt, who was the daughter of the man that we will be honoring June the 14th. And it, it's just incredible how interwoven the history.
history of the Cherokee, folks, if you think they were in North, South Carolina, Tennessee, Georgia, and Alabama, you got another thing coming. They were as far north as Indiana, up in Kansas and Missouri, and as far west as western New Mexico before this was a nation. I, I, I blew a transmission in western New Mexico. I'll never forget the day as long as I live. If we'd have made it that last one mile over the top of that mountain, we'd have been stranded in eastern Arizona where there's a whole bunch of nothing. And I managed to get our Ford Explorer turned around and we coasted 19 miles back down that mountain and my grandkids, <laughs> my granddaughter is, Wee! my grandson, we're going to die. <laughs> Reserve New Mexico. There is a rooster poo nowhere and reserve is 62 miles on the other side of it. We were stranded there for five days. Everyone in that town, population of 325 people, is descended from Cherokee people. So, I don't know whose history to believe anymore. Yes, sir? Um, I'm crazy. Good I people. Know Conklin family, which was the largest nation in North America. So, how did we fall in with the Cherokee as far as I mean, we were? I mean, the Algonquin nation is. Those so Blackfoot. Large. Now, we were out, yes. I, I met him over there and I said, we, we belong to the same family. Yeah. And, and All right. we you know, originated out of Sherbrooke, uh, Canada, and Quebec, which was. The lines weren't that solid. And uh, like I said, the men can Blackfoot. Now, okay, depends on whether you were north, east, south, or west. You might be called Anishinaabe, Ojibwa. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> as a matter of fact, I know a Blackfoot just moved back up to Michigan and it's driving him nuts. He knows some of his people are around there. Every couple of weeks he walks out and there'll be 10 pounds of wild rice <laughs> sitting on his chin. <laughs> He's a descendant of Grey Owl, Bear Clan, Blackfoot. When they made their migration south to find a Cherokee wife, they don't talk about the fact that a lot of those Cherokee women had their bags packed because they were treated like royalty up there. I'm sure that some of the Cree and the Chippewa mm -hmm. and those guys came along with them and said, where are you going? Yeah, let's go. Because I don't care what history says or Hollywood says, we weren't going around killing one another all the time. We were too busy making a living. The Carissa Comacruro people, seven clans of them, and the Cacalote clan is still the most active here in Texas. Uh, the Quatacamato, not so much. They kind of decided to go ahead and be black. Quatacamato seems, it means burnt skins. And folks, they were of African descent. And they got here before the white man did. But every year, the Carissa Comacruto would send out runners down into Old Mexico, up the Rio Grande, and what is now New Mexico, all over Texas. Hey, party time down here at the mouth of the Rio Grande. And they'd all gather up down there and it was time for games, trade, alliances, courting. <clears throat> so I don't care what, how we're painted out to be. Uh, Goyakla, Geronimo, one of the baddest of the bad. The last one to lay down arms. The last free Indian. Among his people, if you killed your enemy in warfare, you weren't allowed to return into the village unless you were cleansed by the tribal elders. If you took a life, you took something you could not give back. Only the Creator can give life. So we've gotten a bad rap out of history. But we learned when the Western European came here and started pushing people off their lands and uh, 
What's this scalp taking crap, you know? We learned that from Scott. <laughs> and the French. French, yeah, the yeah. French caught on to that real quick too. And I do carry a traditional scalping knife. I have one. <laughs> but the the Appalachian Trail, which was the hunting trail of the Indians. Yes, sir. When so up in the north, when when it became winter time, you know, they had to come down the Appalachian Trail. That was the only trail they used coming down from the hunting grounds. And that brought them down in. And the way I heard it was that that some of them didn't go back. Oh no. And they and that's I don't want to start an Indian war here, but <laughs> it's sort of how the Cherokees uh, started off. Well, it's quite possible because uh, the language similarities are absolutely amazing. Yeah, that's uh, that's what I'm hoping. What's what's really hilarious, okay. Columbus Discovered America. There was lost. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and us men are still like that. We won't stop and ask for directions. <coughs> Eric the Red got here. And boy, he covered a lot of territory. I wanted to see the Viking rune stones in Oklahoma. So we drove up there one weekend. My wife went along with me. Now, I had heard stories of a Welsh druid somewhere around 100 A.D. or 200 A.D. that came over from the British Isles, found what he liked and returned and gathered up his people, came over here and settled down among the Mandans on what is now the Missouri River. Now, we're talking, you know, 1,800 years ago. I notice the history books don't mention the red-haired, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, green-eyed people among the Mandans on the Missouri River when Lewis and Clark crossed this country. However, every time some farmer in Oklahoma plows, he finds a new rune stone. They're all over the place, breaking many plow points. But they can translate these Viking runes, and I have seen Medoc's name that Welsh druid, I've seen, and they're recognized as Blackfoot Cherokee. Yeah, see, my, my, my <laughs> aunt, my aunt always said that I was Blackfoot. Uh huh. And and um, and so when I started researching it afterwards, because my my grandmother said, "No, we're Cree." <laughs> she she wants to think that's her daughter. Yeah. <laughs> my aunt, and my grandmother was really something and, um, and um, she said no we're free so I, I went in and I started I knew where the family originated from yeah Sheriff Brooks in, in Quebec and then that was the big um, uh, creek but there were some white <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going by my grandma well you know here I'm the only Cherokee I know of I hardly speak any Cherokee at all and uh, <laughs> it's almost funny because one of the first true Native American traditional healing ceremonies that I ever attended, these Carissa Comacruta, they took me into a Lakota sweat lodge, a seven prayer round sweat and those Lakota like those lodges hot, folks. And I came right out of that and went into a Chippewa eagle calling healing ceremony. And I, folks, I don't know how you're going to take this, but I saw miracles happen that night. I really did. The problem was that the missionaries, because the people of this country this, this continent were practical and if it was too hot they didn't wear a heck of a lot of clothes and they sang and they danced their prayers nobody wanted to know what they knew there is a book and I recommend if anybody can find it I've given every copy I've had away written by an ethnologist named Hansen back in the 1930s, she got up there among your people, the Chippewa Decree, and wouldn't go away. 
So the elders finally called a council of elders from across the continent. And I mean people from as far south as Mesoamerica to come and tell this young woman their stories of the pale one who gave us our rules of right relationship. He was described as being auburn-haired, olive-complected, gray-green eyes, wore a white robe everywhere he went among the nations. He chose 12 men to walk with him and learn. <laughs> and we Cherokee said, what is your name in your homeland? He said, my name is Yeshua. We didn't have syllables in our language to pronounce the name Yeshua. He said, call me what you will. So we called him Sisa. He gave us two rules of right relationship. That we love and honor our Creator and all the creation and that we love one another. That was it. An old Navajo elder told me one time, said, he gave the white man ten rules to confuse him. <laughs> 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 but these elders came and talked to Miss Hansen and told her all their stories of the pale one. Now the interesting thing is, the people of Mesoamerica down there, he told them, because you follow the way of the jungle, the way of the tiger, your civilization will fall. And it happened. The Spanish totally destroyed them. And despite their best efforts, all us folks up here north of Rio Grande are still here. <laughs> But yeah, it's, it makes for some interesting reading. Yeah, because in the Algonquin, uh, they, they state that their ancestors came from the west where the sun sets. And that was, you know, the Lenape, the, Lenape, the Delaware people. Yes, and I had a copy of the Red Record, the Wallamola. I loaned it to somebody and it never came home. And folks, last century, some young man in a museum found bark carvings or bark sheets with pictographs on them. So he dug around until he found somebody that could interpret this part of the pictographs and another one that could import, you know, interpret this one. And he worked at it for a long time and then he finally published this book. Well, he had it ready to be published and he took it to some I don't know if the Lenape exist as a people anymore, but he knew somebody of that heritage. And he took it to their elders and said, what do you think of this? They said, you did a good job, son. So they published it. Reads like the first five books of the Bible, folks. And it's almost, it's out of print and you can't find it. And I made a mistake alone in mind to somebody and it never came home. And I'm madder than Dickens about it, but evidently they needed yeah, it more than religion, I did. The religion, is, uh, you know, it's very close. You know, I met, I met at a time in my life, I met a husband and wife who were from the uh, Indians. They were Lu from the Lucian Islands. And, uh, and uh, what they were taught is a lot of stuff that's, I mean, way over into the, you know, even with the um, you know same teachings as what's in the uh, Algonquin teachings. Yes. I mean it's like you got to be kidding me. This is an illusion. <laughs> you know, the islands off Alaska. I, well, yeah, and, we and, thought and I thought we were, were a bunch of pagan heathen. There was no planes. There was no you know no roads. There's no nothing. Yeah. And how do they have the same thoughts in their culture as these others, and the same with the you know the Cherokees? With the Algonquins. <laughs> you, you said uh, earlier that uh, Spring Frog came to Texas before uh, Diwali. Diwali. Yes, sir. He got here in 1782 and he was given the land grant in 1789. Okay. Did, did he stay here or did he go back? Well, yes, sir. Okay. They didn't want to go back to the east. There's too many white men moving in. <laughs> Well, the bowl went first to Missouri. He was up there in the Boot Hill of Missouri until that big earthquake where the Mississippi flew back, flowed backwards. But Sequoia had been taking people over to a place on the Brazos 
long before that. He had already taken three or four or five groups. There were probably a thousand people. Well, I, my son there. found out that Sequoia was my great, great, great uncle by marriage. And uh, when he decided to go find the people who had left, he traveled in secret from, uh, I believe it was Creek Path, Alabama. And he traveled across into Oklahoma and stayed a couple of weeks with uh, Arch Campbell resting up and provisioning himself because he was already an ill man. And they took four or five people with him and traveled south down the Cherokee Trace. So he came right through here and ended up down into, in Mexico with those Cherokee that had traveled long before him. They were an offshoot of the old settlers up there in Arkansas and Oklahoma. And he died down there. But I grew up knowing none of this. The family never talked about it. I mean, I grew up a quarter of a mile from Wingate Truett's cabin and I didn't know my great-great-great-grandpa built that cabin. So, so what are the specs on that book by Hanson? What is the title? And uh, He Walked the Americas. That is the title. And how do you spell Hanson? H-A-S-E-N. And I'm never going, if I can get my hands on another copy, I ain't never loaning it out again. I'll stand over them with that tomahawk in my hand. <laughs> and the other book is what? The Red? The other one is called The Red, The Walam Olam. And I'm not sure how to spell it. The Red Record of the Lene. Lenape, L-E-N-N-E-L-E-N-A-P-E. -E -E. And now they are called the Delaware people. They've traveled across Asia, across the Bering Straits, into North America. They went across Canada. And some of them turned south and went down into southwestern United States. And it talks about their meeting people already here. And it seems like every time they find a new body in carbon date, it's just pushing that further and further and further back. Well, you know, when the Battle of the Natchez took place, down yes, there, sir. they stopped at a Delaware village. And that's where the battle took place. So Delaware were here. Oh, yes, sir. Even before them. Well, they were the descendants of the Lene Lenape people. And that's where probably where the language similarities come from. Yeah, because in, in the culture, they're so similar. I mean, there is changes, but it's... it's, it's it, okay. I mean, it's just... <laughs> it's just... You can't be coincidence. <laughs> you, you get seven clans up there with the... Uh, the Haudenosaunee. You get seven clans with the Cherokee. You got seven clans with the Carisco-Macrudel. They even build their summer huts the same way. You know? <laughs> yeah, we went around and fought all the time. Because, because the, 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 the tribes, they, they all were traveling to follow the, uh, the food. I yeah. Mean, that's what it was all. I mean, that Appalachian Trail, I've been on many parts of that Appalachian Trail. I mean, that comes all the way down to the south, you know, because the winters are too tough up there. So, so I think some people just said, hey, I'm not going back. I took a wrong road. turn one day coming here. back from Houston, you know and I, I mean? ended up in Jacksonville, and I met one of Diwali's great great grandsons. Mm -hmm. So they're still here, mm -hmm. despite Texas' efforts. She started to say something. Yeah, so this is kind of off the subject, but. When is the dedication of the Truett Cabin? That's going to be June the 14th. Okay, uh, when you're here the next time, we'll have some of your relatives here, some of the riches, the riches for Truett. Bring them on. I've got 6,000 cousins I've never met. That's Paula Thomas and uh, the, the 
there's several of the descendants of the rich here. There's several of the pine forests north of the Fifth We're doing this grave dedication and the military honors and the salute in conjunction with the Truett family reunion. Because I want all the family that can be there there. Well, you know, you'd, you'd, uh, you'd be directly related to Captain Henry Stout also. Henry Stout, because uh, the, the Richies are married. In, in See, that I don't know this man. Family, and then Seal Stout, who guarded San Ana after the Battle of San Jacinto. Really? It was uh, his son, and he married a Richie, and they lived in Pine Forest. So that would be some of your relations. Wow. It, it's it's nutty. A friend of mine named Jim Bell. I went to high school with him, and I didn't have a lot of friends. Nobody will ever believe this, but I was so shy when I was a kid that people had known me for six months before they found out I could talk. <laughs> <laughs> I was a loner. I was always out running the wood. But Jim Bell was a friend of mine, and we went to high school together. And if one of us got sent to the principal's office. The other one just get up and follow him because we knew we were going to be implicated sooner or later. But he's going to be coming up and uh, reporting on this thing with the Truett family because it's Texas history. John Wingate Truett has a little bronze plaque in front of his tombstone, and I'm over there scrubbing tombstones right now. You know how much moss can accumulate from 1839 to now? And uh, it says, Citizen of the Republic of Texas. I didn't know that I had a grandpa that was one of them Texas rebels. <laughs> and uh, I'm sitting there looking at that and the dates on all these family tombstones and I must be related to everybody in Morris County, white and black and Cherokee. <laughs> That's the entire history of the Republic of Texas in just my Family and I never knew it. I grew up a quarter of a mile from the cemetery in the cabin and no one Ever shared this with me and I don't want my grandchildren to be left in this kind of a You know situation I want them to know who they are They stand on a firm foundation. Of course. I was the black sheep in the family uh, Anybody here old enough to remember a bunch called the Deacons that used to be over in Morris County, Texas, rode these big old long motorcycles and hmm. guilty. Well, when I got back from Vietnam, I was mad at the whole damn world and didn't care who knew it. <laughs> but by the grace of God and the love of a good moment, I'm still here. And I'm having the time of my life. Where did you start your journey, or when? How long have you been at it? Gosh. Where did you start at? When that preacher made that statement, that must have been about 32 years ago. How and did you know where to start? Sir? How did you know where to start? When I brought my wife back to meet the family before we got married, I should have known better. Because when I asked her to marry me, her horse bit me on the butt. <laughs> At any rate, when I brought her back here, my grandmother showed her this book that had tribal roles in it. And she points out my great, great, great grandfather, John Hass, had a tribal role number. That's Leon's, they call me by my middle name, that's Leon's great, great, great grandfather. But she never told me. Hmm. But she's the one that left the hand pencil records in the old family Bible that when one of us got hungry, we found it. And that answers a whole lot of questions about this hard-headed family of mine. So, you never know where it's going to come from. All you got to do is just, any journey takes one step to start. And I'm, like I said, there you go. the more I learn, the dumber I get, the older I get, the more. Growing old is mandatory. Growing up is optional. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm the biggest kid on the block, and I'm going to stay that way. 
Hey, what do you know about Quantum Parker and the Comanche? <laughs> I know I have a cousin who is a descendant of Quantum Parker, and she has the Comanche hair trigger and the Cherokee tenacity. So I won't try. I try not to make her mad. Where's she from? Where's she at? <laughs> In Gilmer. Gilmer. Yeah. All right. I've been the guy down Gilmer. You Gilmer. know the Coxes that are descended from Quantum Parker? No. Her daddy was a Cox. Well, you know, we got, it's kind of interesting uh, what we were doing, you know, I was really getting the history of it. And uh, we did Eugene, Oregon, and Linda painted a portrait of Quantum. And uh, this little fellow walked up and she said, she does a pretty good likeness of my great grandfather. <laughs> you know, he said, you up. Will you come and see, uh, see my dad, you know, because he'd like to see that too. His name was Clifford Clark. Uh, and he'd give us the whole lineage of Quantum Parker. He had seven wives, and he had a whole bunch of kids. And all these uh, names go down, so we got the lineage of Quantum yeah, Parker. Sure from that time, we are on down to, oh, let's see, it would have been Clifford was he got me dead now because he's 92 then. I can't remember which daughter. One of Quanta Parker's daughters married a guy named Cox. Cox is in there. Yeah. Oh, well, Uncle Gene Cox. One of them. Yeah. Uncle Gene Cox and my aunt Sue, Martha Sue Hass, my daddy's youngest sister. And she looked like an idiot. They were a fascinating pair. He was a Dangerfield policeman. Comanche police, but she was a deputy sheriff. <laughs> Otto, we've been asked if we can get copies of this stuff right here. Yes, sir. You can have copies of anything I've got, and I'll bring more. Okay. <laughs> because. <laughs> is this Spring Frog? <laughs> that is Spring Frog. To Anita. But. He just disappears from Mexico, from Texas history. It's like they don't want him to be here. Longview is the northern border. Where'd that map go? They got okay. See, there's a historical marker down on Highway 80. Look, here's Longview. There's the northern border. There's a Sabine River. And that's the land grant right there. Well, they married uh, Mitchell Sanders. Married Susanna Springfrog. And uh, their daughter, um, <coughs> came down. She was born in Owasso, Tennessee. And they made a reason. And found a lot of these first called Artville. There was a store for Arthur and a Johnny Cage's restaurant for Artville. Long after it first started there. What was the year? Well, we don't know. We were here before 1835. We got a Spanish land right here. You hear what's happening here? Yeah. When the railroad came through, he was the postmaster. They, they ran the general store and they started the Methodist Church. And they sold land to the railroad and went on top of the hill and said, This is a long view. And everything that was art building, they picked it up and moved it up on the hill. And that's now called Long View. But there, if you go there, there's this little mark about a mile this side of the Johnny Cage's restaurant for art building. Um, and they had a daughter, which we thought was going to be in my great that they gave her the name of Mitchell. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. And she married Jesse Martin Blanc. And they, all my daddy's people, came from Bryce. Well, this is a better map, and I made this one because this is where I'm located right now. 
And right there is where the French found that Cherokee village. No, I did not know. Yeah. Somebody up there in Jefferson one day walked up and he said, Is that real? I said, Yeah, it's real. He said, That's too pretty to be real. And one of the guys with me said, Let him shoot you with it. <laughs> And, uh, oh yeah, I'm having a time in my life. That's a traditional tall style drum. Sir? Sir, I'm going to ask you, would you, would you please try that? Thank you. <laughs> that makes me nervous. That, that's, wow. Uh, yeah, this is made the old way. I got some buffalo rawhide and I teach you how to make one. You know, that's what I do to people. I teach them how to do it rather than do it for them. Yes, ma'am. I would like to know a kind of brush, bleach, and water, and elbow grease. Don't spray it on the ground. No, but I've got some yeah. stuff that I've been using. I'll put it on the ground. What is it? Well, if you'll give me your stuff, I'll send you back. I can't tell you. I need your information. The way this one came to us, I couldn't believe it. My daddy, in the late 60s, was out in El Paso, Texas, and he had a friend named Herb Sherwood that wanted to start a gun manufacturing company. You ain't going to believe this. This is just the weirdest story I ever heard. And uh, daddy was a gunsmith. When he passed away, he was building a 458 American. What the heck can you hunt with in America with a 458 American? 18 wheelers, trains. So I said, well, yeah. Pretty big. <laughs> so anyway, he helped her get this gun company going. This is the 40th gun made by Replica Arms, El Paso, Texas. And if you look at the serial number, there's an A in front of it. Oh yeah. It stands for Archie. That company is now Connecticut Valley Arms. Largest manufacturer of black powder firearms yeah, on the I planet. Know. I know, that's where I'm from. So like well, <laughs> <laughs> that was the 40th gun made by the great grandpa of the. Um, it, and, and I would not take for it. You notice we haven't fired it. Mm -hmm. We're not going to. Mm -hmm. But my son loves to carry his grandpa's yeah, gun. But a few of the ones, and I think you're right, I think it's 3,000. That are only there was yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, this is beautiful. Thank you. That is very well done. I've been in the Colts when when they when they do their um, um, all their uh, engraving. Yeah. And the first time I was in there, we were walking. We we're on the second floor, walking down. And that's hand carved antler. <laughs> Did you make this flute, sir? No, sir. A man named Ravenhorse made that one for me when I first started playing the flutes. Well, my, I have a son-in-law that had one real close to it. It was made in weather for Texas. And I don't know about whom. Well, it's a very traditional design. Yes. Uh, but the I'll, markings on that one, as far as I know. I copied his and made one. Uh, yeah. But I've been, it's amazing, collectors fascinate me. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm amazed at what people will collect. And this guy wanted to buy my flute just so he could hang it on his wall in his den. And he got up to $5,000 and I finally one day said, look man, this was made for me. <clears throat> and I don't care if you're standing there with a million dollars, you're not going to kill the voice in this instrument, this flute. This is mine. And he couldn't understand that. Yeah, I made one for a nephew of mine and he hung it on the wall. Oh. Uh, 
I found one that was split right down the middle at a powwow one time. And it's sitting on the table. And every time I kept walking by, that thing just called to me. And I just couldn't stand it. I went over and the lady, I asked her how much she wanted for it. And uh, she said, well, it's split. I said, I know, I'm just asking how much you want for it. She says, well, it can't play it. I'll take $20. I said, you're on. And I took it home and gave it some tender, loving care. My wife thought I was crazy because here I am sitting there, I built a cone, I could stick it in the end of it, and I had a hair dryer blowing warm air up in there so it sucked the glue down into the split. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and then I clamped it. And I left it set for about five days, and went and took the clamps off, and then I took some steel wools, gently started rubbing, and I had to resurface the bird. And it has the sweetest voice. And my sister-in-law took it away from me. Thank you. He got acquainted with this guy called the Pink Cave, or he made a movie on it. He's out of uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Never heard of it, sir. Let's see. Seven nine seven two zero four three. I never call myself. It's a pie. It's a pie. My sister lives in Pittsburgh. I'll try to bring you some.